It's absolutely terrific. Let's start, though, with the NBA, because this Lakers-Mavericks game was one of the more fun, weird basketball games that I can remember. The Mavericks open up this enormous lead. I think the biggest that I saw it get to was 27 points at 48 to 21. But even still, I mean, with three minutes left in the second quarter, this was like 56 to 31. It was it was a big deficit for the Lakers. And then two guys just really took over, it felt like. First and foremost, Anthony Davis, I thought was incredible in this game. Across the board, obviously his shot making was really big. His rebounding was really big. He goes for 30, 15, four assists, three blocks. But I thought his defense was enormous in this game. He's a guy that has like this reputation for not playing hard and not looking all that engaged, but he was locked in in this game. I thought he was switching out onto the perimeter at a really high level. His rim protection, I thought was awesome. His weak side rotations across the paint. He was just always available, always there. He made life really, really hard for Dallas. The second guy is Jared Vanderbilt. Yeah. I mean, my goodness. I have like a notated section of <laughs> like from the 345 mark in the second quarter, like 345 left in the second quarter, all the way through the third quarter of all the things that Jared Vanderbilt did in this game. It was unbelievable. He completely changed the tide, I thought, with his energy, his activity level, his defensive ability on the ball, on Luka Doncic, taking on that tough assignment. It was it was something, man. I, I absolutely loved this basketball game. And I, we'll talk about it from the Lakers' perspective first. I also think this was a very telling, concerning game for Dallas, if you are a Dallas Mavericks fan. But let's start with the Lakers. Let's start positively. What did you take note of in this game? Yeah, so Anthony Davis on offense was huge. And the big buckets that he had is spin move, kind of turnaround jumpers from the, the left side of the floor, particularly around the left elbow. Just him getting to his spot, something that Dallas was not able to get away from. They tried to do some double teams, and you know the Lakers would swing the ball around a little bit more, find the open guy, like some big shots in the second half from – couple teammates but really this was Anthony Davis on the offensive end willing them to victory and just getting enough points in the half court setting to offset what was not a very good LeBron James game and it seems like he tweaked his ankle or his foot a little bit so maybe there's something to monitor moving forward for just how LeBron is doing but Anthony Davis was absolutely incredible getting to the basket finishing through contact he had one major putback that he was able to just grab this offensive rebound improbably is in traffic amongst three or four Mavericks go right up and slam at home. Like he meant business and he was playing this like it was a playoff game. That was really what stood out to me about Anthony Davis, but Vanderbilt kind of won this game for them. His energy, the way that he flipped the script late in that second quarter and then carried it all the way through the third quarter is what gave the Lakers life and brought them back into this. I, I think the, front court defensive tandem of AD and Jared Vanderbilt should strike fear into teams in the Western conference. It, it can, it can do a lot of damage just with the energy, the activity, the amount of ground coverage that these guys have Vanderbilt plays his role to a T, but you could see how he was frustrating everybody on the Mavericks front court guys. He was getting into Luka Doncic, his energy and passing lanes was huge. Everything he did changed the complexion of this game for Los Angeles. So I just want to read you a like set of notes that I took that Jared Vanderbilt did starting at the sure. 345 mark of the second quarter, 345 left in the second quarter, all the way through basically till the third quarter. So huge offensive rebound with 345 left Vanderbilt grabs it, gets fouled, makes two foul shots. Then he gets a stop in isolation on Luca, then gets a steal and deflection that leads to a Malik Beasley run out. Then he gets an offensive rebound off of a Malik Beasley missed free throw uh, from that and one on the Beasley run out. Gets a corner catch and shoot three after that. Gets another Luka stop uh, on like a floater in the lane, basically. Forces an offensive foul on Luka Doncic uh, late, in the second, late in the second quarter. And basically was like the driving force to get it from 25 points that they were down at the start of this with 345 left to 14 points at halftime. It was 61 to 47. Then he gets a huge steal early in the second half, I think with like 10 and a half minutes left. 
massive offensive rebound just when the Mavericks are starting to get away again. They get up 17. Vanderbilt gets the extra possession. It leads to another LeBron offensive rebound, leads to a lob for Anthony Davis. Then Vanderbilt gets a huge defensive rebound, pushes the pace, throws down a dunk in semi-transition. Then another defensive rebound pushes, grab and go, finish at the rim on like a really impressive uh, change of pace uh, right in the lane where he was able to kind of navigate some traffic, something that he has struggled with throughout his career. Uh, then he jumps a passing lane to get a transition dunk next. Then he gets an, a rebound off of a Luca block from uh, Anthony Davis is the one where Anthony Davis kind of rotated over and swatted Luca. Um, they get a transition bucket that way. Another offensive rebound with six minutes left in the third quarter. Uh, then another defensive play where he got his hand into a dribble handoff between Tim Hardaway Jr. and Luca. He gets the steal, throws it over his head for a Troy Brown run out, then gets another offensive rebound and put back dunk at the five minute mark, then gets another offensive rebound at the four minute, 30 second mark. That's like 12 straight minutes of Jared Vanderbilt. I believe at that point, it was like a four or five point game. Basically, his energy, his activity level, his defense, his willingness to pick up Luca 45 feet from the rim made this like a 20 point swing for the Lakers. He was kind of the swing piece in this game. Anthony Davis was the best player on the court in this game, I thought. But Vanderbilt's energy and activity level completely swung this game for the Lakers. It was unbelievable, I thought. Well, and he did it all the way down the stretch, too. It wasn't just in that second and third quarter when they needed it. He was really strong and active in the fourth quarter. You could see him forcing yep. that late-game turnover when the Mavericks are down three, the sideline inbound, trying to get one last look. Closed the game. He closed, closed the game that Closed line. the game out by hounding Luka Doncic, not allowing him – to, to get a clean inbound. It kind of gets semi-deflected into the backcourt. Luca doesn't know if he can grab it, so he tries to save it. And Lakers end up getting possession, adding to their free throw total, and that clinches it. Like, everything that he did throughout was so, so impactful. And this is, to me, he's the most impactful ad that they made around the trade deadline. That, yes, D'Angelo Russell and what he's able to bring from a floor spacing perspective fits so much better next to LeBron and AD. But Vanderbilt changes the complexion of how they guard, how they play with energy, and allows them to get out in transition. That's the biggest thing that this Lakers team needs. They're going to struggle in the half court. Darvin Ham is not this X's and O's maestro that is running all of these pristine sets and putting guys in positions to succeed. Like He has his one bread and butter that he goes to, which is the Austin Reeves back screen for Anthony Davis on a lob. Yeah. And they got a three out of that today, which was, was really crucial and timely. But beyond that, there's not a ton of creativity going into this. They need transition in order to keep up with teams a little bit on the offensive end of the floor. Vanderbilt and Davis together fuel that so much. I love that defensive tandem. So worth noting, D'Angelo Russell misses this game yeah. with a sprained ankle. A lot of Dennis Schroeder in this game, uh, both good and bad. He had some really positive moments late in the game. He had like a couple of little floaters, flip shots. Also eight assists versus only one turnover. I thought that was a really, really critical number for Dennis Schroeder. I thought he took care of the ball, took some wild, you know, maybe maybe those are the turnovers that sometimes happen with Dennis Schroeder, the wild shots that don't really have a chance, but he was under control. He was very polished. I thought he played a really, really solid, well-rounded game. Jared Vanderbilt, just to close the loop there, ended up with 15 points, 17 rebounds, including eight offensive rebounds and four steals, including the one at the end that closed the game. I mean, my goodness, just a an absolutely ridiculous Jared Vanderbilt game. The, the Anthony Davis of it all, though, is interesting here because it feels like for whatever reason, people have been so quick to forget how good Anthony Davis has been this year. I think it's because he didn't start the season incredibly well. But then he had that crazy stretch where he was like one of the three best players in the league over the course of like a 20 game sample from basically like game 10 to game 30 or something like that. And then he gets hurt and now he's back. And it feels like he is really starting to come into his own here 
uh, over these last couple of games, you know, against the Warriors now against, uh, you know, this incredible Dallas game. I, I feel great about where Anthony Davis is at. How, how are you feeling about the way that this thing is going to go for AD moving forward? Yeah, it, it feels great. And another reason it feels great, you look at some of the different lineups that the Lakers can trot out there now. They can provide, you know, the different floor spacings that AD needs to be able to operate. Like in a late game when he was trying to close things around the elbow, they had good floor spacing around him with Beasley out there with Austin Reeves on the floor. Like there, there's enough shooting that they're able to cobble it together. Defensively, there were moments when I just looked at the court and I said, holy crap, the Lakers are huge. They had Mo Bamba, yes. they had Rui Hachimura out there. Like they can play really, really big next to Davis. They can play small and put him at the five to create a marginal advantage and space the floor properly. Like this well, is well, just, just straight up, like an Austin Reeves, LeBron James, Jared Vanderbilt, Anthony Davis, two through five lineup is just huge. huge. All four of those guys are plus defenders, especially when they're engaged. Like if LeBron is like really, really locked in. He had some moments where you could tell like whatever is going on with his foot, like bothered him tonight a little bit. And it was, you know, hit or miss occasionally for him on that end. But you'd expect that assuming they can reach the play in the playoffs, that he'll be pretty engaged. They were just long. They were active. They were aggressive. This is something the Lakers have not had this season. They have played very small throughout the course of the season. You know, one thing that I have stated throughout, you know, in all of the trade coverage I did and all of the podcasting I did, they played over half of their minutes this season prior to the trade deadline with two guys that were at least six foot three or shorter on the court. Patrick Beverly, Russell Westbrook. Um, you know, obviously Dennis Schroeder was within the mix there as well. Kendrick Nunn was within the mix there as well. There, there were just a lot of smaller guys on the court and guys that aren't very good defensively. Schroeder has done an okay job defensively at the point of attack this year, but he hasn't been, you know, he's just not big in the way that this team needs around him. And if you have another small next to him, it's just a little bit difficult. With this big group that they can play and they can close with, it's enormous. Like they, they are really, really tough to beat. Now you brought up Rui, you brought up Bamba. I mean, I don't know how playable those guys are no. like this, this no. bleed blew out in a big way, you know, starting near the end of the first quarter when Darvin Ham trotted out a, it, it was Austin Reeves, Lonnie Walker, Troy Brown, Rui Achimura, Mo Bamba lineup. And it was only for like five possessions or so. And then they brought in LeBron for, I want to say it might have been Lonnie off the top of my head, but it's just not, you can't play that many players that are somewhat deficient in terms of feel at once. Like, you know, for as athletic and long as Bamba and Rui are, they are just not high field guys. And Lonnie Walker additionally is a great scorer for someone who can come in for limited minutes, you see if he's hot or not. If he's not, you know, put him back on the bench. It's hard to play those guys and get efficient offense together at once. You know, Austin Reeves is really, really sharp. Troy Brown just can't really shoot consistently, so you don't really have to guard him out there. It, it's difficult, I think. And I have no idea why Darvin Ham is just not, like, staggering Anthony Davis and LeBron in a more substantial way than he is right now. But – it's a fascinating, fascinating bench unit where you can get Rui on the court with, you know, LeBron and AD. You can get Mo Bamba on the court with LeBron and maybe try and get a couple of lobs, a couple of pick and pops. You can't run full bench units. And I'm a little bit worried about whether or not Rui, Bamba, Troy Brown are going to be really playable in the playoffs. But you're going to get D'Angelo Russell back as well. So you're going to get that extra 25 to 32 minutes a night where you're not going to have to cover for it. So I think this Lakers team is in a really, really good position as long mm -hmm. as Darvin Ham plays the guys that he should be playing. And that's been a question throughout the year, but I thought he did really well throughout the second half of this game to make the adjustment to rolling with the guys that were working and rolling with the lineups that were working. No doubt about it. Uh, I struggle knowing what to do with that bench unit myself. So, uh, you know, not to deflect blame in any type of way, like Darvin has got some stuff to figure out and I'd like to see the Lakers get fully healthy before uh, 
he can tinker with the lineups in an effective way that leads to what he'll be doing in the postseason. But uh, like Bamba, Rui, Troy, they, they do worry me a lot because they're kind of redundant next to a lot of the star players that they have and not good enough yep. to be able to sustain the minutes when they're not on the floor. The other thing I want to note about this game from a Lakers perspective, and I do think this could end up being like a season shifting win for them. Mm-hmm. Just in terms of like, we know what our identity is now. It's crash the glass. It's play super active and aggressive defensively, play long defensively. I hope that they take the right lessons from this game. And I think there's a real chance that they could. I also think the Lakers are a team that is, from a roster perspective, if Darvin Ham puts the right players on the court, almost tailor-made to cause this Dallas team problems. And this is where we can transition into the Dallas piece of it. If I was a Dallas fan, I would think this is a nightmare game, basically. I I would be very, very frustrated and disappointed because this is all of my biggest fears about this roster coming to life. The Lakers bludgeoned them on the glass. The Mavericks this season are something like, you know, middle of the pack in defensive rebounding rate and dead last in offensive rebounding rate. And it's going to be really, really hard for them. I think in the playoffs, particularly when they run up against teams that are going to try and crash the glass against them to hold up when you're dealing with guys like Dwight Powell and Christian Wood in the front court as your rebounders. I thought that the Lakers just absolutely aggressively attacked the offensive glass in a way that led to extra possessions. The other piece of this for the Mavs that really worries me is we can talk about how LeBron had a bit of a deficient game by his standards this season. LeBron still had 26 and eight and was huge for them largely because Dallas just doesn't have anybody that can slow him down. Dallas tried to run out Reggie Bullock on him. It didn't work. Tried to run out Josh Green on him. He bullied Josh Green to the rim. You know, they tried a few different things, like Tim Hardaway Jr. occasionally was out there on him. Didn't really work. You know, I saw the late in the game, if I remember correctly, just, you know, Frankie Smokes ended up on him. Yeah. Just in a, you know, scramble transition situation. And he just bullied him to the basket, right? And this is before we get to the Anthony Davis of it all, having 30 and 15 and just completely dominating their front court in such a substantial way. This was the worry when you move Dorian Finney-Smith for Kyrie Irving. It's an upgrade and it's certainly a long-term upgrade because guys like Dorian Finney-Smith are easier to find than guys like Kyrie Irving. You just have to hope that you know, the time bomb that can be at times Kyrie Irving doesn't go off before yeah. you can replace Story and Finney Smith. And you have to resign Kyrie in the offseason. Yep. Yep. We'll see how that goes, you know, based off of all reports. There seems to be some willingness to work together there. Who knows? I, I would be very, very worried about the short-term ills that currently befall this Dallas team. And I would be much more worried about it based off of this game. So the lack of wing defense was obvious as soon as they traded Finney Smith away and didn't replace him with anybody in in that It's it's big wings. Like Josh Green is fine against smaller guys. And Reggie Bullock is fine against like, you know, six foot six and under guys. It's the bigger guys that are strong that are going to give them problems. Well, and it's funny because I thought Josh Green was most effective when he was guarding Austin Reeves. And yeah, they got into it and got chippy for a, a moment in time. But that's the type of guy that Josh Green can create chaos against. The The lack of a bigger wing for them defensively causes a lot of challenges. But what I want to focus on isn't just the lack of personnel that they have. It's the the rotations that they can't make when they have two guys like Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving chilling off ball. And that one transition cross match that you referenced earlier where LeBron had Frankie Nilakina on him and just bullied him all the way to the basket. What I was watching the entire time on that possession, Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic standing as the two lowest guys on the opposite side of the floor, just kind of watching Frankie get bulldozed to the rim and not doing anything about it. No help, 
no coverage. You tried to trap the box or, or at least send sort of a scramble, no stunt down. They just stood there, negotiated about who was going to guard who in their spot and stood there and watched LeBron bully him. Like there's, there's going to be a lot of help coverages that the Mavericks can't deploy in sending extra help to guard those bigger wings because Doncic and Kyrie aren't always the most tuned in as off ball defenders. And look, I think that they can do it for stretches in the postseason, but this was what two minutes left in the game when LeBron bullied Nilakina to the basket somewhere around that point in time. If, if you're not dialed in in this type of game after the Lakers have mounted that comeback over the course of the last two quarters, then it's going to be really hard to just flip that switch and turn it on in April and May. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, if I remember correctly on that shot and I'm actually literally pulling it up while we talk sure. the, the Anthony Davis turnaround post up, like, you know, drop step to the baseline yeah, fade away. Yeah. Yeah. So I just pulled that up. The Mavericks answer to Anthony Davis in that late game situation defensively was Luca. Like yeah. it was not a situation where that was a switch scenario and Luca got stuck on him. They were like, we are going to guard Anthony Davis with Luca Doncic here because we think Luca gives us the best chance to succeed. And I do think Luca, when he's engaged and when he is not, you know, taking a bit of a breather because he's running everything on offense for Dallas. I think he can be like a pretty okay defender a lot of the time, but he's not the guy that you want on Anthony Davis. And if that's your best option, just given that Luca is six foot eight, doesn't have crazy long arms and Anthony Davis is six ten, six eleven, and has a seven foot five wingspan. He's always going to get a clean look in that scenario. There's just not really a, it's not a way to slow that down. In well, any well way. I, I think part of the, the rationale, if I'm kid is I would put Luca on Anthony Davis knowing that I'm going to have to double team it anyway, which prevents Luca from being involved in the scramble. And it, it just saves him a little bit more uh, energy as he's not the one that's going to be rotating out of that double team. He sticks with AD. They trap, try to get the ball out of his hands. Like I, I understand some of the concept of it there, but the, he, the engagement part has to change. And part of the reason you bring in a guy like Kyrie Irving to this organization is so that Luca isn't doing as much heavy lifting on offense that he has to rest on D. And this presence of Irving in the lineup should eradicate those excuses. And I think the Mavericks defensively still need to get to the point where Luca is buying into playing that role and being much more engaged on the defensive end of the floor. It's really the only shot they've got at winning a postseason series or two this year. Yeah. And, you know, you can maybe if you're a Dallas fan, make the case that Kyrie Irving did not have his best game. You know, he goes for 21, 11 and five if you want to look at the box score. But he was eight of 22 from the field. He was two of 10 from the three point line. And a lot of those were fairly open looks like didn't shoot it well in this game. But I mean, you take away those Kyrie three point attempts. I mean, this team shot like 18 of 39 from three, like they almost made 50% of their three point looks outside of Kyrie. And then, you know, Luca made 50% of his threes. You look around Tim Hardaway jr. Went four of eight. Josh green went three of five. Christian Wood went two of five. Reggie Bullock went two of six. You know, Justin holiday went two of five, right? He made those two big early threes. So it also just felt like the Lakers, the Lakers did not care if Justin holiday was open it, from three in this game, they just didn't, they didn't care. If, you know, in the nine minutes that Markeith Morris was out there, they didn't care if he was open. Uh, Josh green, they eventually started to care if he was open, which was interesting that that is a, that is a potential thing to look for. I still think that the Mavs are not at a hundred percent. They're going to get Maxi Kleba back and Maxi's defense is going to be huge for them. He is arguably the most important guy here moving forward for Dallas alongside Josh Green, if only because I think those are the two guys that can be real two-way players for this roster. I don't know if I trust Justin Holiday, just given how limited he is on offense outside of potentially making spot threes to be like a real difference maker for this team. And again, he's like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, as opposed to Dorian Finney-Smith, who's 6'8", and can take on like really tough defensive matchups. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. And I mean, obviously they rolled with a lot of Dwight Powell late in this game Mm -hmm. uh, over Christian Wood. I I just, again, I think that comes down to defense and rebounding. I think they probably feel better about Dwight Powell rebounding and playing tough defense. I I don't know if that's right. I mean, Christian Wood had nine rebounds in this game and was, uh, I didn't think he was terrible. I mean, you look at the box score, you know, he had 17 points or no, he had 14 points and nine rebounds. I think they won his minutes out there, but I don't know. I mean, it's it, it's gonna it's gonna get interesting, and maybe you can make a case that having Maxi allows them to play Christian Wood more, right. to like insulate him with more size and more defensive ability around him. But it, it's it just looks pretty clear that like that Dallas coaching staff doesn't seem to trust Christian Wood uh, in the way that the box score numbers indicate. Uh, the, look, this was the perfect storm in a lot of ways. The Lakers, as you mentioned at the top of this, are tailor-made to hit on a lot of the the challenges that the Mavericks have as a roster, particularly on the glass. Yes. They, they pressed them with energy, completely changed the, the momentum of that game. Dallas didn't have the personnel to be able to respond to it. And then Kyrie kind of went cold in the fourth quarter and wasn't able to knock down a lot of shots. Kind of the perfect storm of a lot of different things. I think that there are some orange flags to be aware of. We knew that the defensive personnel just wasn't going to be there. Now we get to see in action what it looks like against other really good teams that also have bigger wings that the Mavs just can't match up to. Yeah, no, I I think that's right. Okay, let's take a quick commercial break. Do you have anything else before we move on from this Lakers-Mavs game? Look, uh, the Lakers are good. This is a good Mm -hmm. team now that they have surrounded LeBron and AD with shooting, with defensive activity, with more size. These moves are going as well as what I thought they would, as well as what you thought they would when we talked about some of this stuff. I see every reason to be excited about this uh, Lakers Mavericks or this Lakers team moving forward. And the Mavericks are still going to be a really good team. It's just that you wonder how they're going to match up, I think, with opposing teams in the playoffs, given some of their inherent limitations on the roster defensively and in the front court. 